again, welcome you all this morning on this uh, frigid February day, and good to see you. If you're visiting with us, uh, make sure you uh, let us know you're visiting. Uh, we welcome those who are joining live stream today, and uh, so those families that are enjoying us from your living room or wherever that might be, we welcome you. We have this year been talking of, and, and it's come out of, a, of, of really a necessity, a need, Lori made mention of it, that we are facing some tremendous needs in the world today, in our nation, and in our churches. Uh, this, not just the COVID pandemic, that has, I think, raised the bar in the problems that the churches are experiencing, but the world, the people, our community needs the Lord. And it's just not the lost, but sometimes within our local church, there's a discouragement, there is a falling away. And so we have, we've been calling so far this year that we would rally and pray. Revival starts when we begin to call on his name. And there, and if you sense, and I, I've been hearing it, I have been hearing it for some time, maybe in a heightened way that a sense of, of where is God? I'm not sensing him. I'm not experiencing him as I used to. Uh, and maybe a lack of belief, a struggle in the areas of your faith, in the areas of, of course, getting together with brothers and sisters in the Lord, in growing together, and maybe just being discouraged with the times that we're living in. Uh, these were all spoken of. You go to the book of Timothy, and it talked about as we move towards the last day, some of the things that will happen. And so as you read through those, we can see a number of those events taking place now. What I wanted to do, we've been talking in regard to that we've, we're in, in seasons of dryness, it's a time for our, us to put our roots down and to discover God where maybe we've not had to discover him before. I've been experiencing that in a profound way, discovering him, pursuing him. Some of that comes through the discipline of prayer and fasting. Fasting removes some of my own obstacles so I can pursue him in more of a straight line than a crooked line. And it really prepares the way better for me to pursue God. We have been talking about the need to come into agreement in prayer. Last week, we talked about the power of being united together in prayer. Today is my, one of my favorite topics. It's a pattern because God makes invitation, come into my presence. He invites us to come. That, that, that is a wonderful thing. 2,000 years ago, we didn't have that available as it is available today. Prior Christ and him going to the cross and being raised from the dead, we did not have the direct access. What they had was a set of rules and regulations that they, God set in place because God desires to be with us. He desires to dwell among us. But because he's holy and we're not, there required a pattern to get there. And so in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus and in the book of Leviticus, the second and third book of the Bible, he establishes a pattern, and the pattern was through a, a tent, this, this place that was called the tabernacle. Now, some of you maybe have studied and know a bit of the tabernacle. Some of you maybe have traveled. The tabernacle was available. They had a replica down in Toronto for a number of years. As far as I know, I don't know of a replica anywhere in Canada at this point of the tabernacle. But some of you maybe have done that and seen it. Others, maybe the tabernacle is just a, it's an Old Testament word. It was a place. You don't know much about it. And I really can't do a whole lot in a matter of a couple of days to talk about it except to give you maybe a bit of a brief about the, the focus of what the tabernacle was because it's as significant today as it's ever been. Because as we learn from the tabernacle of the Old Testament, the way to approach God has never changed. We don't go through that as a tabernacle. We go through a different tabernacle. So let's pick this up in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews is a New Testament text. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1 now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. Now I want to slide down to verse 8. 
The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Let me just pause before we go to the next text. Let me just go back to this. Note this. There's a first covenant, second covenant. The first covenant was pre-Christ. The second covenant was after Christ. The first covenant had rules and regulations to get to God, but God still made it available, inviting people to come. <clears throat> to come and to, he welcomed them to experience him. Now, very in a very different way than we do today, but it was a welcome. And that was the first covenant. And so we established an earthly sanctuary called Tabernacle. But in verse 8, he's describing that the New Testament, the picture, we no longer have that tabernacle. We don't need that tabernacle. The church is not a tabernacle. This building is not set up to be a tabernacle. Now, some churches have called a tabernacle, and it's not wrong. But the furnishings, I mean, you don't need all those furnishings that they used to have in the old tabernacle. Here's the point. Note in verse 8, the old was meant to illustrate the new. So we live in the new, but we're going to be a little amiss if we don't understand something of what that old was, because the old helps us to understand the new. So as I approach God, as I desire to have an encounter with God, he has set some things in pattern for me to do that. And if I understand how he set it in place in the Old Testament... I'll be able to follow that same principle to approach him today. This principle of approaching God through the seven steps I'm going to be sharing is personally my number one way of approaching God and has been for years. I was in my 20s when I don't know what caused me. I think it was because I just, I remember reading about the tabernacle in the book of Exodus and I go, I don't know anything about the tabernacle. I, I can't remember having studied it when I was in school so uh, I just began to personally study the tabernacle, and I fell in love with what it was all about. And ever since, it has been my number one way of approaching. I follow through these steps frequently, every week in approaching God, following through, because he, God set this in place. He says, if you want to experience me, if you want to have an encounter with me, here's how you can come. And so I've, I, and it, you know, wow, it's effective. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I want you to note verse 19. Your body is now the temple. Now, the tabernacle was a tabernacle. It was a tent. It was made so it could be moved. It was a big tent. Multi, multiple components to it. When the city of Jerusalem became the capital city, years later, they built a temple. But the temple had the same courts and same furnishings as the tabernacle. It was a permanent dwelling. So the tabernacle, they could move it around. That was the tabernacle. The temple had the same furnishings, only it was permanent. Now, when he makes reference in 1 Corinthians 6, we no longer have to go to a building. There is no temple today. But... Christ has, he dwells inside us. We are, this is, we are, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is, when we surrender and sacrifice and come and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit abides inside, and we are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the tabernacle temple, now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. How do we approach God in the way that God has designed? So here's a picture. I'm going to go to the picture of the tabernacle here. And this is where my uh, pointer comes in handy. I'm going to draw some attention to some things on the tabernacle. First of all, I want to go to this side over here. Uh, this is a poster. And Lori and I picked this poster up a number of years ago. I've got it at home. I love this poster. And this is a picture of the tabernacle. It's a, uh, a bat made of badger skins around the outside. It's not all that big. I always thought it was huge. But honestly, uh, probably from the front of this room to the very back of the room, would it, like this, it'd be narrower than this, but that would encompass both the size, approximately the size, the entire size of the tabernacle. It's not huge by any stretch of the imagination. I want to draw attention on this one over here. Note on the left here, the picture of the encampment. And so the children of Israel 
were camped all the way around. The tabernacle was center. It was meant to be center. Again, God gave the dimensions. He says, I have chosen to dwell among you. You can actually approach me. And so he, he established this place so he could dwell among the people. And in a moment, we're going to see there's the front gate. That was facing the east side. This is the gate over here. It's the same gate. You would come in and you would come to the first piece of furnishing and there would be, it's called the brazen altar. We'll talk about that in a moment. And fires took place on this altar. Sacrifices were made. You come into the second one right here, uh, which is called a laver. We'll talk about the laver. This is the laver over here. Then you come to a second part of the tabernacle called the holy place. And it was totally enclosed all the way around and on the top pitch black inside except there were candlesticks inside that were lit so we'll talk about this next week and then right over at the end of it there's a third component which we can't see from the outside and it was called the holy of holies and in the holy of holies it separated the outer part the holy of holies holy of holies inside this tent but right at the very back now you see this pillar of fire Scripture often talked about the pillar of fire would come over top of the tabernacle. On the day of atonement, when the high priest would make that once a year sacrifice, only once a year. Now, priests would go in every day into this temp, the holy place right here. But only once a year did they go past the veil into the back part of it. There was a, there was a veil you had to go in. Only the high priest could go once a year. And he had to have gone through all the steps that we're going to talk about here to get to that back part and present a sacrifice, the, the, the presentation of blood seven times, he would present it on the mercy seat, or we know as the Ark of the Covenant. And it talked about in the glory of the Lord. Uh, came at nighttime as a pillar of fire during the daytime as a cloud. Uh, you may see it here. You see a picture. They've, the artist here tried to render that people are standing out in front of their tents, and they would. Uh, tradition has it that on the Day of Atonement, the people would stand outside the tents to see if the sacrifice would be acceptable. It would be acceptable if the priest truly was consecrated and was in obedience, it was accepted. Uh, but not necessarily. If he decided to be in disobedience, then, then it was bad news for him when he, when he got to before the Ark of the Covenant. And so people would be in anticipation for the acceptance of that once a year offering. Now today we're going to be focusing on what the priestly duties taking place in this, this part of the tabernacle. Uh, that's all we're going to focus on today. This part over here is where we're going to make focus. So I hope that's not confusing. This is normally an eight-part teaching of mine, and some of you were in part of that. I, I look here and I remember some of you were part, five years ago I did on Wednesday night an eight-part teaching, eight steps into the Holy of Holies. So this is like eight parts in two weeks. So uh, please endure with me. Now, if you were to take a helicopter ride and go over top of it, I want you to see that uh, you would see it, it's in the form of cross. This is 186,400. 800, These were the men counted plus women and children that were around the tabernacle. Here's the tabernacle right here. And, but if you were to fly over the tabernacle, you would notice, interestingly enough, that it, the furnishings are actually in the formation of a cross. They're in the formation of a cross. If you were over top, you'd see a cross. Now, I don't know if that was intentional at the time. I, I'm not going to say it was. But it is interesting because it fulfilled everything the cross of Christ would fulfill in the New Testament. If you were to sit right above it and look down upon it, you would see that it actually is a cross within a cross, which is, I think, kind of cool. So the seven steps into the presence of God. I hunger to know him more. Do you? I hunger to experience his glory as some people have experienced his glory. And he welcomes us. He is not a God who says, you need to keep apart from me. He is a God who says, I welcome you. We sang the song, I welcome you. What keeps us from him is not him. What keeps us from him is us. There is still a way to approach him. There is still a way to behold him in his glory. And in his glory, you're transformed. In his glory, you will never, ever be the same. When you have tasted and seen 
the goodness of the Lord in the place of his glory, in the place of the holy place, your life is reformed. You won't forever never be, you will never be the same. You won't be perfect. Oh, far be it. But you will be undone in the presence of a holy God. You will be like Isaiah said, woe me, who am I? To stand before a holy God. You will be like Job says, Lord, who am I to question you? You'll be like John, who when he beheld him for the first time, who put his head on the shoulder, on the, on the bosom of Jesus, who that was the disciple, yet when he beheld him in his glory in the book of Revelation, he fell down though, though he was dead. This is the guy who actually been with Jesus. He was the closest than anybody who's been with Jesus, and yet in Revelation, he fell down, hardly able to breathe before an awesome and holy God. He welcomes us into his place. I'm going to share seven steps that God established to enter into the presence of God. I invite you to take notes, take pictures, write it down, because um, they're not necessarily easy to recall. I'll give you that. We start with the outer gate. The white linen you saw around the outer gate, and in the outer gate, there's only one or the outer court, there's only one gateway in. There's not four. There's not a back door. There's not a tunnel. There's not a ladder over top. There's only one way, and it's at the front gate. We see a picture here, the front gate right here. And the gate is called Gate Beautiful. And it is beautiful. It's a beautiful gate. Let's look at this just for a second. Let's hold this up here just for a moment longer. Uh, The 12 tribes were located around this gate. There was no way to enter this tabernacle but through that gate. It didn't matter if you were wealthy or poor. It didn't matter if you were a man or woman, a grandpa or a grandchild. It didn't matter if you were a priest, if you were a prophet, if you were a pharaoh or a king. Everybody had to go through that gate. There is no other way to get into the tabernacle. There's one way. Kind of sounds familiar. You're going to see this. Remember, remember, this is an illustration of what it is today. We're we're going to see the illustration. This is a picture. There's only one way to God. He established one way. That is why today, based on this, the Jews still today pray facing what direction? They face the east because the gate was on the east. It's called Gate Beautiful. Because it was Gate Beautiful, it is a beautiful gate. There's four colors to that gate. Four colors are white, blue, purple, and red. And each one of the colors carry their meaning. There's the color white. And the color white is the picture of purity. We often use the expression, he will wash us and we will be as white as snow. As white as snow. The picture of a bride getting married. She dresses in a white gown. The reason that that had been established as a white gown was that she was presenting herself as a virgin in her purity to her husband. And so therefore, white represents purity. And so the picture that of the gate, and of course we know the gate is Jesus, that we enter only We can get to God only through Jesus Christ today. Jesus is the gate. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no person can come to the Father but through this gate, through Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other prophet. There's no other, you can't work your way in. It's through Jesus. He's the gate. And the white represents he is the spotless lamb of God. No sin found in him. The second color on that gate is the color blue. And blue is the color of the heavenlies. It's the picture if you look up into the blue sky, and today's not a day like it. You can look up into the, it's a blue sky. And he came from the Father. Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2, he would say that he made himself lower than the angelic host to become man. He came down from God. He is deity. He's divine. He was sent from the Father. He was before the foundations of this world. He existed. He is from the heavenlies. Blue is a picture. He's from the heavenlies. The third color is the color purple. Purple is the picture of royalty. 
He's from the line of David. Another 14 generations go back to the line of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then you follow the line, you read of it in Matthew, first chapter. It, it's important that you understand he's from the line, the covenant line that was prophesied. From this line, a Messiah will be born. And Jesus is from the line of royalty. He is the Messiah. That was all around the crucifixion. Who do you think you are? Some say that you're the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? Jesus says, it is as you've said. Could they prove it? Yeah, you could follow his lineage. That's why it's so important to track the lineage. He's the Messiah. He's from the line of the king of David, the line of Abraham where the covenant was established. He's the Messiah. And the fourth color was red. What do you think that represents? Calvary. It represents that Jesus went to Calvary. He shed his blood so that he took our place. Our sin was upon him. Our chastisement was upon him. It was meant to be our death, but he took my death. He went to the cross, and by shedding his blood, his red blood, by shedding his blood, I am now free. Not just because he shed his blood, but because he rose again, and he conquered everything that sin had done to take away from God's children. He had conquered it. Now, that is under a lot of attack today because there are a lot of folk who believe there's different ways to enter to God. There are many ways to God, but he established one. If you never start here, you don't get to the rest of it. There's one way, and Jesus would say, I am the way. There's no other way. Through me, through his purity, he is the son of God. Some people question that. He was just a good man. He was just a good teacher. No, 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 it's not. He was the son of God. He was from heaven. He is divine in nature. Therefore, the virgin birth of the story of Christmas, the virgin birth is essential to our belief system. I've had ministers contest with me. Do you really think? They mocked it. Do you really think a virgin gave birth to a boy? It's like, yes. Yes. Because God said it. And it had to be, or there is no Messiah. There is no forgiveness of sins if it's not from God. And then thirdly, he is messianic. He is royalty. He fulfilled all the laws that God had said would need to be fulfilled. And lastly, he gave his life and rose again. Again, the same minister confronted me. And he says, do you really, like we believe figuratively he rose from the dead. And I go, figuratively? How do you figuratively believe somebody rises from the dead? Either they rise or they don't rise. It's one or the other. I may not be the, you know, the sharpest tool in the box, but it's one or the other. He rose from the dead. And there's significant proof to that. Four ways. First step is through salvation. And we're going to go on to the next one. But that is a significant step. And I'm not going to assume, I never want to assume everybody has come in through that gate. Not everybody has come through that gate. And maybe even today, when you recognize and you see that and you, you talk of the significance of the colors uh, at the end of the service, we're going to give opportunity. If you've not received Christ as Savior um, in his purity, his divinity, his royalty, and his sacrifice that he has given us, then welcome him as your Savior and embrace him as your Lord. The gate became the first, the first that they had to enter in. And as soon as you get past the gate, you enter into what we call the outer court. And when you move into the outer court, there's now six pieces of furnishing that will take place. Six furniture, we're going to call it furniture, but they're uh, stations, steps, and there's, I want to start by the outer court. So we've come past the gate, we're into the outer court. Okay, so we have the picture here. So now we're moving, and this is the outer court. All this is the outer court. We're making references. You see, there's two pieces of furnishing in the outer court. We're going to talk about, so let's talk about the outer court. There's three components to the tabernacle. There's the outer court, then they refer to the inner court. The inner court is the tent. And then at the very back of the tent, there's the Holy of Holies. That's behind the veil, where only the Ark of the Covenant is. So there's three, three sections, three courtyards that you enter in through. And this is a picture of something that God reveals 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, this, what you see here has three components to it. Body. Okay, so do something with me. Just go ahead and give yourself a little pinch. Do not pinch your husband or wife. Okay, Pascal, no. So, okay, your body, that's your body. And your body is, your body is world conscious. Your body is based on its five senses. It's material. Your body, this body will one day die. I'll lay this body down. Now, there's many today, secularism, humanism, believes that the end of all things. That's the end of all things. I think one of the problems we've had, because what made this pandemic particularly, particularly difficult and destructive, I would say, is too many people viewed the body as the only component. We treated it as if it was all, the be all that ends all. And that was a problem. It continues to be. That this is all, that, you know, eat, drink, be merry, for we will die, and this is the end. And no, 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 it's not the end. When we were created by God in Genesis, we are never called living creatures. When he created man, he called us man, Adam, after God. And not one other living creature did God move upon him and his spirit into him. Not any other creature did God do that for, except man. He breathed into man the Zoe, the spirit of God, and life came forward. Soul and spirit, spirit came alive. So the three components, body, soul, and spirit. We can consist of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And so the soul part, so the body is world conscious. The body, we're going to represent the body as kind of like the outer court. It is the picture of, again, we're coming to God. The body's the outer court. Then the holy place it's pictured of our soul. And our soul is made up of three components. And I know some people here, if you're cleansing stream people, you know the three components. What are the three components? Somebody talk to me. Keep going. Oh, there we go. So, perfect, thank you. That must have been Sharon. Was that Sharon? <laughs> that was Sharon. Mind. Uh, these are the three components of the soul. Think about this, mind. The mind is your, your, your intellect. We have the ability to grow and learn and pass that information on. We are able to do things. I mean, I, I plug in things. I don't understand all the details of electricity, but somebody does. There's a lot of stuff I do, but, but we pass that information from generation to generation. We grow in mind. We grow in intellect. We can grow. We can dig in. We can increase as much as we want to, or as little as we want to, for that matter. So we are people of mind or intellect. That's one part of our soul. Separates us from, from creation. Secondly, we have will, our will. This is the place where we reason. We just don't have an innate instincts. You know, just innate, a lot of creatures do. But we have reason ability. We have ability to choose between things, multiple choices based on our will. When we come to God, that's why God could never force his love upon us. We have to love him back. How come God, everybody's saved. How come God, you know, condemns people to hell? No, they don't because they have a will. They choose to do that. They choose to do that. We choose to do that. We make choices every day. That's a part of your soul that God has given us. And the third component is the spirit. And the spirit is either dead or alive. Either dead or alive. And Adam, when he breathed spirit into him, he was alive. When Adam sinned, we call it the nature of sin, his spirit died. But in salvation through Christ, our spirit is quickened again, made alive in Christ. And so our spirit is dead before we come to Christ, but our spirit is made alive in Christ when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. He quickens our spirit. We come alive in spirit, called a baptism of our spirit, baptism of our spirit. He baptizes us in his spirit. Therefore, we are to go through the waters of baptism as a testimony to everybody else. That's why we have waters of baptism. And so we're quickened alive in Christ when we come alive. We're dead in our trespasses of sin until we invite Jesus, but then we become alive in Christ, having come through the gate. We're alive in Christ. 
spirit baptized. And then, and then in the New Testament, he says, uh, you know, uh, be baptized in water because this becomes now your testimony, your testimony to the world of what's happened in your spirit. Three parts of man. Uh, our soul is self-conscious. Remember, our body is world conscious. We're five senses. Our soul is conscious of ourselves. And uh, our spirit, our spirit is God conscious. When he quickens us, now we, now we become God conscious. Until then, we don't understand him. Until then, we, we know him from a distance. We cannot, we are not illuminated by his spirit. But when he quickens us through salvation, comes alive, we become conscious of God. We grow in God. We grow in his word. So isn't that kind of cool? So you see the elements of the three courts. God is saying, this is the approach if you want to get to me. You come, first of all, through the gate of salvation. The gate of salvation. And Psalms, I want to, I want to share three other things that when we come together and worship God, three more components. Psalms 100, verse 4. Some of you will recognize it. Finish this for me. I will enter his gates with... I will enter his courts with... And then there's a third component, which is worship. There's three more components that, that are part of approaching God. It's called thanksgiving, praise, and worship. And they are not the same. Thanksgiving is where you thank him for what you remember, for what he has done. So you are bringing remembrances. So when I give thanks, I'm, I'm saying something based on what I'm remembering a person has done. So when we thank God, we thank him for things he's done, we things we remember. Uh, it might be biblical, it might be personal, it might be things we've heard or seen. We thank him for that. We come into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his, the thanksgiving is the outer court. The outer court, we give thanks. And then we enter into the courts with praise into the courts. Praise different than thanksgiving. Praise him for who he is. Who he is is the attributes of God. So, attributes. His goodness. His faithfulness. His righteousness. His, he's God of refuge. He's my deliverer. He's my king. He's my savior. He's almighty. We can, all the attributes, all the attributes. We praise him these are, at, we've not asked one thing from him yet. It's all about him. We thank him for what he's done. We praise him for who he is. But as you continue through, now I can teach you, we can teach each other how to thank God. I can teach you how to praise him, show you his attributes, but I cannot teach you how to worship him. Worship is his invitation into the Holy of Holies. And I can't teach you that. It's where he invites you to come past the veil. But you won't get past the veil until you have come through the place of thanksgiving and praise. And then he invites you to worship. We often say we come and we had a worship service. We had a worship meeting. We had a worship whatever. But often it's not a worship one. It was thanksgiving and it was praise. He didn't invite us because we never came that way. It's why, you know, Pascal and myself and others, I'm animate. When we begin to bring ourselves before God, let's start with the place of thanking God. Let's move to the place of praise. And often praise tends to be a bit more up-temple because if we start with the place of petitioning and requesting, we don't receive because we've not come in through the gates of thanksgiving. We've not come into the courts of praise and we're illegitimately trying to get into the veil. And it just won't happen because it's selfishly born. We've not beheld him. We have not been undone in the glory of his presence and who he really is. You can't jump into the holy place, the holy of holies place. And so we see, see those three components are so consistent. If we, want to, if we want to meet God, if we want to encounter God, we come in through the place of, again, body, soul, and spirit of thanksgiving, praise. And then he invites you into that inner place to worship with him. And Again, I invite, you don't rush those. You let the thanksgiving be thanksgiving that drains you of all the things you give thanks for. And it's not once, it's, it's frequently, all the time. Praise him for who he is. 
Frequently on Sunday mornings when I do just a quick little 10, 15 minute time of worship and devotion, just rallying together with our, uh, those who are serving on Sunday mornings, um, I just want to bring out the, the glory of who he is. May we behold how great he is. I want to talk about great because then now we can enter into the place of worship. Now we can move into the inner courts with our God. He brings us into those places, an invitation. It's the outer court. Here's the problem. Too many times people want to just linger here. There's a lot of activity in this outer court. A lot of activity. Uh, people can go there. They can go into that outer court. Uh, a lot of things going on. It's a place where we talk about religion. It's a place where we have opinions. We talk about this. We debate this. We, there's a lot of stuff going on in the outer court. If you'll notice, the outer court is lit by natural sunlight. So it's, it's the natural ways of thinking. We are not instantly, although we are, his spirit is birthed in us, the transformation takes a process. And when we've come into the outer court, there's still a lot of work that God needs to do in our hearts. We're in the outer court. There's still a lot of just a lot of world in us in that outer court. Still a lot of world going on. A lot of debate, opinions, fleshly opinions, earthly circumstances. And they, if you're not careful, they will hinder your pursuit of ever going any farther. You'll stop there. I'm going to suggest, I'm going to suggest based on the New Testament, if it said many will not go beyond. Many stop right there. The majority never get to the next stage. Now, might be saved, might you know, claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and you are because you've submitted your life to him, but you've never surrendered to the other steps to go deeper into his presence. And therefore, it always seems like the power of God evades you. It seems like you can't seem to really grasp his goodness and his glory. It seems outside your reach. Uh, in the outer court, you live often a life of whatever. In the outer court, you never get past seeing how God can serve you. So you always have questions. Well, where was God? How come he did that? You will stumble over those questions all the time. Those are the people in the outer court that never move beyond. In the outer court, you live to get. You don't live to give. It's about getting. Well, I didn't get anything today. They didn't, that didn't do anything for me. You're still in the outer court. You're, still in the outer, you're living in the outer court. It's about you. It's about this, the things that stroke us. But beloved, we were never meant to exist in the outer court. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings of Christ and go on to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. It's calling us move on to the place of maturity. If you want God to speak intimately to you, then you need to move to the third dimension. He will meet you there in all his glory. So let's go. We're in the outer court. Let's go to the first piece of furnishing, the second step. This, it is the first piece right here. It's the altar, the brazen altar. In the days of Moses, when a Hebrew wanted to seek after God, remember the picture of the tents all around? They would leave their tent they would go to the eastern gate, gate beautiful. That has the four colors. They would go through the gate and they would come to the brazen altar. They would take a sacrificial animal. When they bring that sacrificial animal, they would have a rope on that and they, the brazen altar has four horns on the corner of the altar. There would be priests at that altar and the person would bring the animal and the priest would tie off to the, one of the horns of the altar. Uh, the altar, and there's dimensions to the altar, and I'm not going to give the dimensions because it just gets bogged down. The Bible talks of details to these things. The brazen altar was though three cubits high, but here's the significance of knowing that. The brazen altar, interestingly, is exactly the same height as the Ark of the Covenant behind the Holy of Holies. Exactly the same height. And the reason is, it indicates that the glory of God will be equal to the sacrifice you make at this altar. Ah. If there's no communion with God at the altar, you won't have a matched connection in the holy place. To be effective in experiencing God, your sacrifice must measure up. Your sacrifice of what you now about to offer, your sacrifice must measure up to the level of the glory you want to experience when you pray. 
And so if you want God's glory, but you aren't willing to sacrifice, it's based on the same level. Where is God's glory? Well, how much have you sacrificed? Now, you can't earn God. You can't earn him. But you need to sacrifice, recognizing I got to lay my life down on the altar of sacrifice. And as I lay my life, based on how much I, David would say, I will offer God sacrifice that cost me something. And David was known to having great encounters with God because he knew extravagant sacrifice to God. If God is only here and there for you, if he's take it and leave it for you, you can go days without interaction with him. You occasionally enter in with the fellowship of the body. If that's all it is, then the sacrifices I'm going to hazard is down really low. The glory is going to be very low. But if you start to lay your life out in hunger and desperation for him, and you pull out the sacrifices in full obedience, as you build that altar, so will the glory be. It's the same height. It was the same height. Too many believers want great power with little or no sacrifice. We don't want to give up everything on that brazen altar. We don't want to die or submit to everything. We don't want to give up living to some of the areas of our sin. We negotiate. We want to negotiate with God on those things. Well, if we do, you won't experience the glory. You will have withheld you cannot get into the presence of God without stopping first. This is the first of the furnishings, the brazen altar, the place of sacrifice. It's the place of blood. And here is where we call it the altar of forgiveness. Now, I'm going to have a number of names, and these, these are significant to me. I, I mention these names almost every day in my prayer time. It's an altar of forgiveness. When you get to the next one, it's an altar of yieldedness. When I get to the next piece of furniture, it's an altar of knowledge. Then the next one's the altar of wisdom, the next one is the place of understanding. And then behind the veil is the place of holiness. Follow with me. Salvation, forgiveness, yieldedness, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, holiness. You follow through. That's how he established it. God said, you want to come to me. You begin to go from one to the next. You can't jump and miss this one. It's not like you know, you're mini putting. You don't want that one because it's too hard. You jump and go to the next one. You can't do that in this one. It doesn't work. The altar of forgiveness. It had four horns in the altar. The animal would be tied, and there's four steps regarding the forgiveness here. First of all is the step of the confession of sins. And in the step of the confession of sin, what would happen is you would bring the animal, you tie off to one of the horns, and then the person would begin to confess, confess the things in their heart, the sins in their heart. Um, I'm going to liken it to Psalms 130. David, he would do the same thing in Psalms 139. David would say, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And then he says in verse 23, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It is here we confess our sins. If we confess our sins, the Bible said he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But we have to confess them. And it's not like a way back when. It's, you know, we continue. Interestingly, every time the priest walked by, there needed to be that representation of the sacrifice of confession. The things regularly, we, we need confession. So we confess. So as a place where the, the sacrifice uh, is started with, I confess my sins. The second part, step two, is the sacrifice is made, and there the priest would then cut the throat of the animal, and the animal the blood would drain out, and the animal would be the sacrifice. And it's their sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of obedience. The third thing within that animal was placed upon the altar, and the animal was burned. And the picture there is that their sins are nailed to the cross and removed as far as the east is from the west. It's the dying to the flesh the dying to the flesh. And the fourth part of it was then that after it was nailed and it was burned, the picture of being burned, then they were consecrated for service. Then the priest consecrated them and they moved on. They were consecrated. They, they had the right to take the next step. Now, let me just back that up again. Again, first part, confessing of our sins. When we go into the place of forgiveness, that's why Jesus, when he taught in the Lord's prayer, he said, if you go and you begin to pray and you say, Lord, uh, forgive me as I forgive others. Whoops. And Jesus said, if you, 
If, you, if you've got some things you need to get forgiveness over, get up and do it because we can't go on. So he, Jesus alludes to this in the Lord's Prayer, that forgiveness is always the first step. When we started our year off on, in January the 2nd, that first Sunday, the first thing we talked about here was forgiveness. Always start with the place of forgiveness. Lord, search my heart. What is, what is there? And deal with it. God, I lay this before you. And then, then the sacrifice. The sacrifice is the sacrifice in obedience I give myself now because of the blood of Christ. We don't have to kill any animals any day. I'm really thankful I live in that day. We don't have to kill any animal. Jesus has paid it all. He was the, but I still have to appropriate that for my situation. Thank you, Jesus. I've received the sacrifice. And then I nail my sins. The sins are nailed. The Ephesians talk about it, that the old man is dead. You're now alive in Christ. Why do we keep resurrecting the old? The old man is dead. Leave him dead. Right? The old nature is dead. I talked a few weeks ago that he has set us free. It's like you're in jail. He's unlocked it, but we're still standing behind the bars. No, we're free. Open the bars and live in freedom. There's a difference to be free and living in freedom. And so therein, the old man is dead. He's been crucified, been nailed to the cross. We live in freedom to Christ Jesus. I live in my freedom. You know, the flesh keeps wanting to rise up. We have to keep putting it down. And then you're consecrated to move on. You're blessed you're released to move on. Which takes us to the last one we're looking at, the laver. The laver, a picture of the laver here. The laver is right there. And it's the wash basin. It was brazen, laver they called it. The wash basin. And they would wash at this basin. Now the cool thing about the laver is the laver was made out of mirrors from the women. So the women were to bring in their mirrors and they made the whole thing. When you look down into the water to wash, you're looking, what are you looking at? You're looking at you. You're looking at you. The whole thing was made out of mirrors. And it's interesting, I think it's interesting, that where did the women get the mirrors from? I mean, they're in a desert. Well, they got the mirrors from Egypt. Remember when they left Egypt, they took the plunder of Egypt with them. They took all the opulence of Egypt with them, the mirrors. And Egypt was a proud land. It was a land that they were... They, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest? Still, right? They were a proud people. And so when they took that, there was a lot of pride with the mirrors. And when you got to the laver, it was to lay down your pride. It was to lay down yourself and all the things you're trying to make of you and let God wash you and make you like him. And so when they left the place of forgiveness, they went to the place, the laver is a place of yieldedness. You yield to him. You yield to the washing. He says, I will wash you and you will be as white as snow. How does he wash us? By his word. As we read his word, and we have you know, illustrations of that he washes us. Actually, I looked it up in the scriptures, it just popped out of my mind where it talks about you're washed by the, by the washing of his word. And he washes us by his word. So as I begin to read, when I open up the Bible and I begin to read the scripture, whatever that is today that I'm reading, and I close it, and if nothing more happens, nothing really ever did happen. When I read the scripture, there needs to be the slowing down of saying, Lord, what are you needing to wash in me today? What needs washing? What do I need to... What dirt has got? What of the world? Is pride risen up? Am I becoming angry? Am I, is it fearful? Am I becoming spiteful? Am I critical? Am I, okay, whatever it is, and you begin to find it. Is it addictions? Is it sin? Is it lust? Is it what? What is it coming out of this? And wash me, Lord. Search my heart. Wash me. Wash me, and I will be white as snow. The laver was meant to wash. And the priests, every time the priest would go, by the laver into the holy place. Every time they had to go by, they were required to stop. They washed their feet because the feet is on the earth. They washed their hands for what they would touch. They were washed. Wash me, Lord, and I will be as white as snow. Wash me. I yield to you. You can't wash. You don't go to this place simply because you've got to read the word. You go because you seek him to cleanse you. There's a different attitude in that. Did you pick that up? I seek to be cleansed. I seek to be cleansed. Lord, I know there's things going on and I need you to show me what that is. Ooh, I see it now. I see it. Lord, Lord, take that from me. 
I offer it to you. I yield this to you, and we offer. So we're gonna stop there. Next week, we'll move on into the holy place and to the holy of holies. We start at the place of salvation, the place of forgiveness, where confession of our sins, the power of his blood, the place of the labor where he washes us by his word. We're on a journey to behold him, on a journey to behold him.